good afternoon. I'm really happy to see so many of, of you here. So I have been given the kind of challenging task to introduce uh, our presidential speaker today, Professor Fred Turek from Northwestern University in Chicago, United States. It is a challenging task because I rarely get to introduce people with that much of stuff behind their belt. So just listing all the positions he's held and the awards he's got received and initiatives he founded and the work that would be, it would take a lot of time. So I will, will not go into that. So presently. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, let me check the Wikipedia. No, he's presently he is the director of the Center of Sleep and Circadian Biology, and it is important thing that is it's apparently the first place where sleep uh, science and circadian biology are being combined into one, which is a really important thing because we need to think transdisciplinary across across the globals also. And he's the Charles and Emma Morrison Professor of Biology in the Department of Neurobiology in, in the Northwestern University. But even more daunting than just listing the positions, which indeed are many, it would be to try to summarize his publication record over his career. Because, okay, let's just say I tried and I figured out that there is a category of scientists for, for whom you don't count the science papers and nature papers. You count those where you made the, you are on the cover. And because he has several of those, and also the covers look very nice. So yeah, I encourage you to just Google them if you, if you would like to so. Um, but also his work um, has been extremely, let's say, even mind-blowingly broad in, in, in topics. So his work in things such as genetics of depression and Parkinson disease, aging, uh, he's one of the key people who has opened our eyes to the diversity and importance of gut microbiome as well as circadian rhythm to our health and well-being. These kind of things that are somehow simple, you, they, you understand immediately what it is about, but you didn't understand that it is how fundamentally important it is for us humans and society until he, somebody like he came around and just told us. And this kind of brings me to the final point I want to make. Instead of just listing the length of the CV, which for many people would be kind of sufficient to, to highlight the importance, I wanted to stop for a second and think what it is to be a scientist. There was a discussion recently where there was a question posed, what do scientists do, in, as opposed to engineers, entrepreneurs, or other people who build things? And the answer, the one comment was, the scientists create and produce data. And of course, that's true, but I believe many of you will agree with me that this somehow deeply unsatisfying answer, because machines produce data. We, have, we need, you need the scientists there to push the buttons to create data, but that's not what we do. What we, are do, what we as scientists are doing we are somehow fulfilling the very deeply ingrained need that we as humans have to get more information. We, are, we, like other mammals, are explorers. We need to have more information about the world. We want to understand how the world is, how we as humans are, what makes us human. And that, I think, is the, what, what his work is really feeding into. He is bringing information and knowledge, insights, not that that is interesting, not just to those of us who care about the details of how some gene is expressed or another one, but this understanding of what does it mean to be a human in the world that we are in. And that's, I think, the most important task of a, of, of a scientist to, br to bring and feed our dreams about what we could be in the future, where we could go literally in places we haven't been and also conceptually to reach something we have not been as a human race. So with this small introduction, <coughs> I would invite you to the stage and feed some dreams for us. Thank you. Yui and Bogna and President Gruss, I want to thank you for inviting me, but it's more than that. I mean, I, uh, the hospitality here has been so fantastic, I haven't told you I'm not going home. <laughs> so, I'm, but before I uh, write to home that I'm not coming back, uh, I want to tell you about circadian rhythms in particular and the role they play in health and disease, but I want to give you a really good feeling for what has been discovered about the molecular base, the genetic base of the circadian clock system, uh, really just over the last couple of decades. Um, so let me start by setting up the, the, what, I'm, what I'm interested in. Uh, you know, we live on this planet, and it, it has distinguishing characteristics that it rotates. Uh, and to me, the way I sort of conceptualize it is that from the beginning, um, you, you, you had to take energy from the sun and use it. 
uh, to create life and to do things that living organisms do, and that's what I call fuel metabolism. But in, you can't run your uh, furnace all the time, so you had to have sleep. And then, in other words, this, for some reason, it's this stupid thing is rotating on its axis, and it was confusing early life, so then the early life came up with circadian rhythms or biological clocks. And so these three things have evolved together, and they're intimately related to each other, and we're making uh, lots of inroads in defining these relationships. And while my talk will focus a lot on, on fuel metabolism and rhythms, um, I will bring in lots of other uh, states that are influenced by the circadian clock. So again, put it in perspective, we live in an environment of, uh, where we, we control the light-dark cycle. We're the only species that really controls the light-dark cycle. Um, and that's a, it's, a, it's a relatively recent event. Uh, I put, you know, the, the, it's really 120 years since we've had electric lighting. And so the question becomes, how does this affect humans from, uh, we're disturbing our biological clock. And I'll, I'll get to that later after I discuss the, uh, the, sort of the basic mechanisms of the clock. And then to put it visually in your perspective, this is the uh, a NASA composite of the Earth from space at night, and I think you can see, um, I don't have to point out to you that we live in a world where in the industrial world we are active at night and we're using light, and it, it, whereas humans in ancient times uh, were not active at night. And um, the issue here is that our clocks are not always in synchrony with external life. And so I particularly focused in, and I studied this very hard, so if I got it wrong, I apologize, but there's Okinawa. Um, <laughs> that, so it's, and, and by the way, I, this hit me one time when I was looking at this. There's one, there's one area in, the, in the a Asia here that they don't have to worry, they don't disturb their biological clock. If you look very closely, you'll see that North Korea has no light at night, so they're, 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 they're an exception. And to, I'll give us a few examples of, of, of the, the implications of this, and I like this one because this was an accident in Chicago in 2014 at O'Hare Airport where the train driver who was coming in uh, on the, uh, the Metra um, fell asleep. Uh, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and that was the result of falling asleep. That's the escalator that takes you from the train up into the, uh, into the terminal. So um, it, there's... It has huge implications, but let me give you now the really big picture. There's been this rapid evolution of circadian field in its role in health and disease. And when I say rapid evolution, two evolving things at the same time. When I started uh, uh, studying circadian rhythms, we were descriptive. We were describing rhythmic processes. We were describing how animals respond to changes in the light-dark cycle. And then we began to uncover some of the physiological bases, some of the neural areas of the brain that were involved, but more recently, we began to uncover the genetics uh, and the molecular basis of the circadian clock, and much to our surprise, and I'll be telling, uh, hitting this theme over and over again, this clock is tied in with all, I would exaggerate, all cellular pathways. That's the thing that's kind of blowing us away. And the other thing, though, at the same time, when I would try to explain why I was interested in circadian rhythms, I talked about shift work, jet lag, maybe aging, but what we the rapid evolution has been uncovering the links between circadian disruption and diseases such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, mental disorders, and and it's just become a phenomenal basic science moving fast and understanding the health implications moving fast is what I want to focus on. And just to give you another visual representation of that, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the uh, clocks in the, in the digestive system and how that uh, affects things like metabolic disorders and digestive diseases. Uh, it, the transportation industry is obviously uh, uh, very much affected by your circadian uh, clocks in terms of your hours of service and uh, uh, and the military is very interested because if you've got to move, deploy forces rapidly across time zones or be awake for long periods of time or operate in, in opposition to your biological clock. And then I'll be focusing a fair amount on obesity. And I, probably, I will not be talking much about how we, we find circadian disruption 
in uh, depressed patients. Just the depressed uh, patient here is the man, and you can see his clock is out of synchrony with the, uh, with the clock, with real time, whereas the non-depressed person is not. Now, with respect to uh, obesity, what I will be talking a fair amount about is that it's really, a, it, in many ways, it's a circadian sleep uh, disorder. I'm not saying it's the only cause, but it certainly is a major, a major cause. Now, as I think most of you know, a major event happened uh, a little less than two years ago now, which also caused the field to kind of explode, which is because the Nobel Prize was given um, in uh, physiology and medicine in 2017 to Jeff Hall and Ross Bash and, and Young. So why did, was the prize given now? Well, I put, I put it into the context of four things. The, the gene was cloned, the first circadian clock gene, and I'm going to tell you more about the genes, was discovered in 84. We knew we were going to discover the gene. That's the royal we on this one. Um, because we had a, a mutant fly which was showing a genetic mutation in its rhythms. And so it was only a matter of cloning it. It took 13 years from the time they found the fly till they cloned the gene. Um, then, this was sort of expected. We thought the clock genes in the, in the molecular clock in the fruit fly would probably be similar to genes and proteins in mammals. And that turned out to be true. What was unexpected was that the circadian clock genes are in almost all the cells of the body and regulate the timing and expression of 25 to 50% of all genes that are expressed in your heart, your liver. And then totally unexpected, in 1984 certainly, and really until the last 10 years, is how this disruption of the clock is linked to multiple mental and physical disorders. And I'd like to think we were a little bit prescient I organized, this is one of the, thank you for mentioning the cover of science. This was exactly, almost exactly one year before the Nobel Prize. I, we or, I organized a special issue, uh, which was staying on track. See, this is supposed to represent a, a night worker in England. Uh, how a circadian rhythm to influence physiology and health. So that was one year before the prize. And I think it's this combination of the basic biology and the health implications, which was, played a major role. And it certainly is, is, boy, when I was, on a, on a, I was coming to work and I saw the prize had gone, I said, whoa, this is going to really move the field forward. And it is. The field is just now exploding um, because it's almost like the Nobel Prize has given this, boy, this is a serious, this is a serious field. Uh, so it's exciting to be part of it. So what we know is we have internal biological clock, internal 24-hour clock. And I like to show this old slide. Um, because it, you don't see your rhythms. You don't, you don't see that you have a rhythm of cortisol. You don't see you have a rhythm of body temperature. You don't see a rhythm of various uh, metabolites. Um, but one you do is your sleep-wake cycle, and you can feel it. So I like this one because it shows a, uh, uh, some student who was sleep-deprived for 72 hours. And if you've ever stayed up all night, you'll notice how you're getting more and more tired, 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 tired. and then around 8 o'clock the next day, you're not as tired. Now, you haven't slept, but you're not as tired. That's because your clock is telling you, wake up, let's go. And then you can do this for three days and see this 24-hour rhythm in how tired you are. So I, I'm not going to get into sleep because I talked about it a lot yesterday, but we, that's one thing that we can, we, you know, we can see. We can see that we're, our sleep-wake cycle is controlled by the circadian clock. Now, the way we study circadian rhythms um, in various organisms is the major rhythm that's been studied in fruit flies as well as in uh, mammals is activity rhythm. Why? Because it's so easy to measure and it's such a great marker of the biological clock. So it's like looking at that, that clock on the wall over there. You see the hands. That's not the clock. The clock mechanism is behind that. The running wheel activity is the hands, and we use it to, to infer what's, uh, how the uh, clock is functioning. And so let me show you a record. Uh, it's an old one, but I like to show it because it's so beautiful. It's even pre-computer pre era. Um, it's a record of uh, locomotor activity, running wheel activity in a hamster on 14 hours of light, 10 hours of darkness. Don't ask me why most people use 12-12, but there's reasons we're using 14-10 here. 
And you can see the animals active during the dark. So whenever it's act active, you see the black line. Then, then at this point, we put the animal in constant darkness. We take away all the signals of the, from the environment, and you can see what happens. Just look at this. Look at how beautiful the free-running rhythm is. The animal wakes up, starts running in its wheel 24.2 hours later every day, plus or minus one minute. Now think about that. And when I begin to tell you about the molecular clock, think about this behavioral rhythm. How do you translate the molecular clock into such a behavioral rhythm? Now I'm not going to go into the details, but you see I've given a light pulse here. That light pulse is occurring one hour here. And you'll see instead of the rhythm being where I would have predicted, it's been advanced. Then I go on vacation to the Caribbean for a couple weeks, and then I come back, and beautiful free-running rhythm, another light pulse right here, and you see I give a delay. So all I'm going to tell you without getting into it, because it would take way longer than this lecture, is that when light at one time of the day speeds up your clock in the morning hours, and light at another time of day slows your clock down. If you think about it, if you've got a clock that's 24 and a half hours, if it's 24 and a half hours, and you, you just drift through. So if you're on a 24-hour light-dark cycle, you've got, to, you've got to slow down your clock. If your free-running rhythm is 23.5, you've got to speed it up to fit, to entrain to the 24-hour day. And we do that in what is called non-parametric entrainment. Light at one time of day speeds up the clock. Another time of day it slows it down. Now I just put this one in because it's, it, I, I want you to appreciate the beauty. This is a, a mouse. For, don't, don't worry about the saline injection. Look at the precision. This is one day, two days, three days, 30 days, wakes up every day 23, 24.3 hours later. And if I asked if I asked the president to come up here and tell me when is this animal going to be active the next, this day? You would draw a line on this and be in trouble if you drew. No, you hear you can probably draw a line and erase it. Um, I had, did have someone one time who got really excited and drew a line, and it was a screen and uh, ruined the screen. So just look at the beauty of that rhythm. And then, of course, uh, just what I wanted to show you a record of a mouse that um, we flew from Paris to Chicago. So this is you see the light dark cycle here is here light, dark, the animal's nicely entrained. And then when we fly it to Chicago, it takes, you can count, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's about 10 days to re-entrain to the new light dark cycle. I was giving this lecture to master students, and I had a student right in the front of the room who said, oh, Dr. Turner, why, why didn't you fly, why didn't you just change the light dark cycle? Why'd you fly the animal from Paris to Chicago? And I said, you understand what I'm talking about. She, she understood um, what was going on. Now, uh, just, I just put this in because this is, just, just came out. Um, we know we can fly long, long distances. The question is, can the human, in other words, the machine, the airplane, can fly long distances? And there's actually studies going on. Can, can humans endure a 19-hour flight? So they've just come up with the, it's called ultra, ultra long flights. Uh, and I like that picture, and uh, it's, that's a good, they're going to see how humans are studies being done. So let me just give you the basic properties so that you have them in, in your mind. Uh, the, 20, the circadian rhythm controlled by a circadian clock, the rhythms are self-sustaining, endogenous. The clock is within the organism. The period is about 24 hours. And in fact, if I looked at 100 mice, There'll be some, C57 black, there'll be somewhere between 23, as you'll see, 23.5 and 23.9. The primary synchronizing agent is a light dark cycle. The master clock is located in an area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I won't refer a lot to this, uh, but I will say on that couple of slides, this is an area, well, I can show it here. It's an area that's an area in the anterior hypothalamus. It's two small nuclei that are the master circadian clock. This, when I say discovered in 72, that was the first indication that's where the clock was located. It took about 10, 15 years to nail that down. Um, but we now know that this is a master circadian clock. 
in that it is entrained by the light-dark cycle. I talked about this yesterday. I won't today. I'll just tell you there are unique photoreceptors in your eyes. They're not rods. They're not cones. Think about that. When I give this lecture to ophthalmologists, they usually leave the room about now uh, because it's, they're actually our retinal sensitive, retinal ganglion cell photosensitive cells so that they project right from the ganglion cell layer to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And so essentially the, the light input system is separate from our visual system. I'll leave it at that. And now I'm going to tell you, though, that was fine. The story was great. But then we had clock shock. The clocks were everywhere. We did not predict this. No way. We all thought it's in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, exactly how those neural neurons are coupled together, what are the circuits. We, we'll discover that. But then we found the clocks are everywhere. And this was um, a nice way of presenting it in a paper we had in Scientific American a couple of years ago. And the clocks within us. And the idea, of course, is that all these tissues, if we remove them and put them in a dish, once we had sensitive enough methods to monitor gene expression, we found the clock was everywhere, except for the red blood cells. <laughs> so anything with a nucleus uh, has uh, the clock. And then the, the, the point of the article was that the body's many cellular clocks in the brain, and then it discusses the various diseases. If you disrupt the clock, the liver, the heart, the pancreas, the kidney, um, what was that one? Fat tissue. So this opened up a whole new uh, area. And then, like I said, this is still an ongoing, it may be tissue dependent, but we're, we, we use 25 to 50% as all the genes in your heart. Let's say your heart is expressing 10,000 genes. 5,000 of them are rhythmic, which means they're, good. they're high at one time, low at another time. Now, if, if the, the circadian clock, the molecular clock, is regulating the expression of half the genes in your liver, what happens when that, that circadian molecular machinery becomes disorganized, disrupted? How does that lead to uh, health and disease? So it really was a paradigm shift in the field um, with the finding. Now, the way, reason it took us so long, we had to have a marker of the clock before we could look at whether the cells of the liver or the pancreas were rhythmic. And that became uh, uh, by, by tagging one of the clock genes to a luciferase reporter gene. And this is just to show you just some, of the, some, some rhythms. Here's the SCN. This is over four days. This is skeletal muscle. You can see the lung. And actually, this is, this is an early result. And now once the tissue culture systems have gotten better, I've seen, I've seen records of the suprachiasmatic nucleus that go out 30 days. Uh, and I've seen the lung, I think, about 20 days. Uh, some people play games with it. How long can we keep the tissue alive? And how long can we see this 24-hour expression? So if you look at it from the, the, big, the big overall picture, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, there it is right here. It's the clock. It's getting the light information. It's regulating circadian rhythms in all the cells of the brain. I'm sorry I didn't put some clocks in the cerebellum, I'm sorry. Um, and liver, uh, kidney. So what's going on here is that the SCN is communicating with all the cells of your body, either directly or indirectly. By that I mean there can be neural connections from the SCN. There can be hormonal inputs, but also if the SCN regulates the locomotor activity, the sleep-wake cycle, and the sleep-wake cycle influences many rhythmic processes, then it's indirect, I call it. Or if I regulate the feeding cycle, then the feeding, the feeding rhythm can actually entrain rhythms in the liver. So you'd say, oh, it's not the SCN, it's the feeding rhythm. No, 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 no. The SCN is controlling the feeding rhythm, which is controlling the rhythms in the liver. So that's why I call it direct and indirect. OK, how did we find these genes? I've mentioned that we were using one of the genes, and that's, the, that's 
my favorite part of the, well, it's not really my favorite part of the story, but it's my favorite beginning part of the story. In the early 1990s, we had no mammalian clock gene. They had the gene in the fruit fly, 1984. And we go to meetings, and that's why I said we thought there would be some literary, because the fruit fly people would get up at an audience like this and go, we got genes. <laughs> Maven people would go, we got neural structures. Where's, what, where's the, uh, does the fly have a brain even? Well, it turns out it does, and we now know where the neural clock is in the brain of the fruit fly, and we know where the molecular clock is in mammals now. So the, the fields sort of came together. Now, I, I showed that picture of a hamster in a wheel. At the time, and this is where you want to be able to adapt your organism, uh, we were studying the hamster as our major animal model, because it has beautiful rhythms, like I was showing you. And if I perturb it with a drug or something, if I have a 20-minute phase shift, I can pick it up, because that rhythm is so precise, so beautiful. But it turns out the hamster was and is a genetic desert. So Joe Takahashi and I, in the early 1990s, we said, let's go after the gene. And we actually were talking with Ross Bash and Hall. We had a very large grant with the three Nobel Prize winners to find genes in mammals. And eventually we said, let's take the same approach you guys took. And we, it couldn't have been done. Or, there were improvements in mutagenesis. And I'll tell you what I mean by mutagenesis in a minute, which allowed us to go after the, the, the gene, but we weren't going to do it in the hamster, because we know how many chromosomes there are in the hamster, but we don't know the base sequences, and we don't know the genes. But what's the major genetic organism? The mouse. And no one was studying rhythms in the mouse. So we had two choices. We could either bring genetics to the hamster, <clears throat> bad idea, or we could bring physiology and behavior to the mouse, and no one was, was, was following circadian rhythms in the mouse or very few people were. And so we set up a program, what I call the mutagenesis and phenotypic screening. And by that, I won't go into too much of the detail. You take a, a male animal, you inject it with ethyl nitrase urea, it creates a high mutation rate in the germline. It creates a high mutation rate in all the cells of the body, but I don't care about all the cells of the body. And after 10 to 12 weeks of treatment, what happens is you kill all the spermatogonia, you kill all the sperm cells out, except for a few spermatogonia. You had, this was, you had to get the dose just right. We didn't get that, they were getting it at Oak Ridge in terms of, of being able to use a chemical mutagen, not for clots, but just a, in general for creating mutations. So this, we, we had estimated that maybe one in 500, one in 1,000 genes would be mutated randomly. Now, you remember in about 19, remember when we used to talk about the human and the mouse, and that had about 120,000 genes? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Now, molecular, but now we know we got something around 20,000, and most, most molecular biologists will, they just, they wave, their, they pretend they never said 120,000. So w if we thought there were 120,000 genes and we were mutating one in 1,000, you can see, well, it's going to be hard to pick up. Um, so we got fortunate that we, we lost 100,000 genes during the, the, the time period. And, um, well, I'll say that we were told this cannot be done. So Martha Vina Turner was a graduate student in my lab. I'll keep coming back to her name. Um, she's the first author of the science paper. She, she, was, she was told, that's fine for fruit flies, but you'll never find a single gene affecting behavior in a mammal. Mammal behavior, mammalian behavior is too complex. I still get that. Someone will say, oh, well, that's circadian stuff. That's simple. But I study, I study stress. I study body weight regulation. That involves 1,000 genes. So you won't find one gene. Isn't that a stupid statement? Because if I knock out the leptin gene, what do I have? I got a, a very obese animal, just one gene. So this idea that this concept that you could knock out a single gene and affect a complex physiological behavioral process was not accepted at the time. I think it's pretty much accepted today, um, in, in large part because I think of the circadian story. My best one was this was um, actually told to me by the chairman of my department at the time, although I put anonymous. Um, Turek, this is not science. What's your hypothesis? 
My hypothesis is I've got to find a gene that's when it's mutated affects the clock. That's not a hypothesis. She said, you're on a big fishing expedition. And then I, my response was, I think it was, or maybe I made it up over the years. <laughs> um, yeah, but we might catch a big fish. And we knew we were getting mutations. We didn't know we were getting a clock mutation until we found it. And let me tell you why. I'd really like this slide. I, I need to get a, a, I can't get a modern version of it because we took it a long time ago. Um, mutations, many mutations are lethal, of course. But we were getting, uh, we had a two-toned mouse. So that's, what, we must have mutated some gene involved in uh, coat color. We had a silver brown mouse, coat color. And then we had two thumbs mouse. So we must have caused some mutation that led to two thumbs. And my favorite one, and it's really now favorite now that I know you study the balance and the, and I was saying earlier, we found a mouse with a curly tail. So what did we do with the mouse? We threw it away. Had I known that you guys were studying tail and balance, I would have saved that mouse and breed and kept that colony going for 20 years or something like that. Sorry. Um, we couldn't pick sure as a per diem. So we knew we were getting mutations. So the mutation that was really exciting and led to the, to the, the, the whole, this, this is now that we're going to find the first clock gene in mammals. So what we did, we would get C57 black, put them on a light dark, these are, excuse me, remember the, the, the mutagenized animal, then the, uh, the offspring. So we're testing the offspring. And we figured if we tested 1,000 animals, we might find one mutant animal. We were guessing that based upon 120,000 genes. And we were guessing there'd be 20 genes involved in the circadian. This was all hand-waving back of the envelope. In fact, I think we did use it back an envelope at the time. And then we'd put the animals in constant darkness. And this is a, what, what night, well, let, let's just say all the mice look like. And then if you look at a histogram, this is the number of animals, the period of the rhythm. So remember I told you that the period will be somewhere between 23.5 and 24. And if you look at, we, this is, represents 205 mice. One mouse, OK, we did get lucky. It was mouse 26. Too bad it wasn't mouse 24, but that's OK. It was mouse 26. And the standard deviation of this is 0.17. We had one mouse, that period was 24.8 hours. And my statistical mathematician friends tell me, given this mean and this standard deviation, you'd have to screen about a million animals to find one. That would be six standard deviations from the norm. Well, here's our guy. Light, dark cycle. So, uh, it, uh, then we put the animal. Um, into DD at this point. DD comes constant darkness. I didn't explain that. And you can see the period is 24.6, 24.7 hours. Now, at this point, we've got a, an animal that's got a really abnormal clock. And I remember when, with Jeff Hall, because we were meeting with the eventual Nobel Prize winners, OK, now we knew this already, but he said, you know, maybe, maybe the mother dropped it on its head. So you've got to show that it's genetically transmitted. Well, it was genetically transmitted. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, and we found out that essentially the clock, we named the gene clock. I wanted to name it time. Joe Takahashi wanted to name it clock. Uh, I wanted to name it time. Figured we could get the cover of Time magazine. But he was very clever. By naming it clock, then when you talk about clock genes, see, the we have a language problem. There's one clock gene, clock, but there's multiple circadian clock genes, as I'm going to show you in a minute. So if you're carrying one copy, because remember that we only you know, we mutagenize the, the male, you have a free running period of 24.7. See how greatly different that is. If you're carrying two copies, we had no idea. And it turned out the animals had a period of about 28 hours. And then eventually, some become arrhythmic. You can't even find any rhythm. So this allowed us to, to chase the gene. And um, very quickly, 
because the genetic tools were becoming available. Uh, MIT was coming out with markers, a weekly basis, actually. And uh, the sequencing, um, Joe Takahashi threatened to leave Northwestern unless they bought him a sequencer. Uh, he wanted a dedicated, oh, well, we have a sequencing facility. We'll get you data, we'll get you data two months from now. No, he, so eventually, we found that the clock gene was on chromosome five. We knew that pretty quickly, um, based upon looking at what would we call SNPs today. And we were able to sequence that region and find that there was a gene that was, had about 100,000 base pairs. And one base pair substitution, see the A to a T transversion, if, you have, if you're carrying A at this point, you have a normal wild type. If you're carrying T, you have a, a mutant phenotype. Uh, as I always said, this, this made me believe in genetics, the idea that I could change one base pair out of 100,000 in an unknown gene and see such a change in behavior. Like I said, we were working. We had a very large program going with the fruit fly people. And so they actually, they, were, they, were, they had the mutant animal that the mutation was in the homology of clock, and they were chasing it. And when we published our paper and they saw the sequence, <clears throat> we beat them to it. So when we wrote the paper, we were able to say, we have found the first mammalian clock. We said, unfortunately, we've not found any homolog of the fly genes in humans. But we now have the first mammalian clock gene. That was a that was almost a joke. We, it was fortunate for us we had no mammalian home logs of the fly genes, because then we could make the claim we had found the first uh, clock uh, gene in mammals. But then we, then we kept going back and forth, and it was like a domino effect. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the other genes, because I focus on the, the clock gene. But very quickly, it was found that clock dimerized with a gene called brain uh, muscle aren't light factor. In other words, it had been found in the brain and muscle, uh, but it, nobody knew that it played a role in circadian rhythms. And then we found that the, this, and I'll show you in a minute, was in a, a, a positive negative feedback loop with a couple of genes that are called cryptochrome and pur. Pur, pur is for period, and it was the first, that's the gene that was cloned and got the Nobel Prize in 1984. So very quickly, uh, the, the gene for the fly gene, homolog, for pur was found in mammals, and mammalian genes were found in the fly. And then there was another gene in fly called timeless. But uh, then, and this should be a question mark anymore. I probably should have an arrow and says n equals 20. If you ask me to guess how many genes have been identified, and how, it depends on how you would define uh, a clock gene. So very quickly, we discovered this, uh, this positive negative feedback loop that involved transcription, translation, and some phosphorylation. Uh, and we found that we, we titled it because we were writing for a liver journal, Liver Has Rhythm. But this, uh, this is me, and this is Ravi Alata, who was the student of Mike Ross Bash. So the fly people, the mammalian people, were trading, if you will, uh, with, and data. And then, this is, I like this one here because there's some physicists here I know. And the cover, the number one breakthrough of the year uh, was something ah, not really that important, the accelerating universe. And, but the number one biomedical breakthrough of the year was the finding the sort of clock machinery in flies and, and, uh, and, and, and mammals. Uh, these were uh, showing universes, with big clouds, and that's why I changed and put the clock in. So, and in fact, the Nobel Prize was given for this discovery in, I think, 2016, if there's any physicists in the room, you can correct me. And then the, the, the clock gene in the fruit fly was given a Nobel Prize a couple years after that. So this is, science was very prescient in predicting it. Okay, what, so I've mentioned, you know, that why now? And I want to get to this part here where, where we're finding the clock genes uh, in all the parts of the body. But before I do that, I want to show, we are also interested in behavioral alterations of the clock. Um, so we, we use genetic manipulations, but we can also behavioral manipulations. In other words, I can shift the light-dark cycle back and forth, back and forth to Paris. To, no, I'll do it to Okinawa, back to Chicago, Okinawa, back to Chicago. What effects do I have? So we, uh, we, 
we work with both genetic and environmental models. So let me just tell you the, the genetic model that, of course, I used was essentially I, at this point, I said, okay, I've got circadian disruption at the genetic level. What else is wrong with you? And then uh, we, I'll, I'll go through this rather quickly. Um, we found that the, it's very important to be observant. It was one of my students, um, where's it, Amy Easton, who I wanted her to study aging in the clock mutant animal. And she came to me and said, I don't want to study aging. I don't want to study the clock mutant animal. I said, first off, this is, a, this is not a democracy. Um, why don't you want to study the clock mutant animal? She says, they get, they get fat. And so this led us into a whole, I said, they get fat? Maybe we should study why they get fat. And Joe Bass had just been recruited at Northwestern, a hardcore um, diabetes, pancreatic uh, uh, biochemist. And I'll just summarize for you that I'll just, I can say it. The clock mutant animals have a regular diet or a high fat diet gain more weight. That's what this slide is showing you here. Now, what's interesting is that um, I always say that what's important if you're trying to move a field like obesity and body weight regulation, you've got to get some of the leaders of that field to buy in because no one's going to listen to Fred Turek and body weight regulation in the field of body weight. But somebody like Bart Stahls, who is a hardcore uh, nuclear receptor individual, he wrote this very nice uh, commentary. Uh, when the clock stops ticking, metabolic syndrome explodes. And he began to link the clock genes with some metabolic genes. And then when you alter these metabolic genes, we know you alter glucose metabolism, cholesterol metabolism. And, and then he had one other very clever slide um, making the point that if you alter the circadian clock system and you alter some of these uh, metabolic genes, you're going to have effects on obesity, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, hypertension. I always like to say that when I go to the dean of the medical school and say I'm studying the biological clock and shift work and jet lag, he go, <laughs> when I told him disrupting the clock leads to the metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease and diabetes, it was, it, I, I had much more uh, influence on the um, what, was, what, what, the, what the dean was interested in. And then I'm not going to go through the complexities of it, and this is really uh, a simplified version. Eventually, it was found that the mammal, mammals have three period genes. So there's three genes that are homologous to the one fly gene. The cryptochromes, we have two. And um, only one clock gene and only one female gene. And that this transcriptional translational feedback loop affects metabolic genes, and we now know metabolic genes affect the clock genes. And so that's a whole area that's worth a, a, an hour talk. Um, and th these, these networks are being built, and we're finding that the clock genes are not just regulating metabolic genes, but they're regulating all kinds of genes that are involved in most signal path signaling pathways in the cell. So I mentioned that we, we study genetic models. Let me show you one very simple environmental model um, which uh, I like to do simple experiments. And in this one, we, we looked at when we disturbed behaviorally when the animals eat, would we affect body weight? So this is such a simple study. It's one of my favorite studies. I had a, a, a student, Deanna Arbel. I said, okay, let's put the animals on a regular chow. Let's put them on a high-fat diet when we know they'll gain more weight. But let's do this. Let's, let's not, they normally eat 70, 80% uh, during the dark. But let's give them the high fat diet and the regular diet, I'm simplifying it, uh, in, in the dark, no food during the light. And this is the key group here. Feed them at the wrong time of day. Give them a high fat diet when they normally don't eat. Now they have no choice. They're either going to starve or die. So they got to eat at the wrong time of day. And the, if I say it's so simple, this cage had uh, food, and this cage had no food. So every 12 hours, she would come in and just move them here, move them back, move them back. And, and the really exciting result was that the animals that were fed on a, uh, a high-fat diet during the light gained more weight than in the dark. 
And I'll just say, I don't need, this is not that important, but it just is making the point that animals fed at the wrong time of day gain as much weight on a high fat diet as if they're ad lib on the wrong time, at any time of the day. So this led us to this idea. We, we, we called it wrong and right time feeding. The term that's now used is phase restricted feeding. So you, you restrict feeding, eating at a certain time. This, of course, led to an explosion of interest in what about the time of day of eating in humans? How does that influence body weight? And how does that, of course, downstream affect uh, conditions related to um, you know, cardiovascular disease and, and metabolic disorders? And let me just say you disrupt the clock. You uh, increase lead to obesity. But let me use this slide to visually have you think about this for a minute. Um, so normally, we have a clock, the SCN, in train to the light dark cycle. It's regulating uh, the liver and the, let's say, the intestine, the clocks. But it's doing it by regulating feeding time. And normally, when everything is right, we've got food, you're eating. It's supposed to be the same time, same time, same time. But in humans, we're the only species who does this we can decide to eat at the wrong time of day. And now the timing of day of feeding has a big influence on liver, and I just said gastrointestinal tract. So now you can see the internal organ rhythms are out of synchrony with the light entrained one in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that's, uh, just to emphasize this point, I was, I was watching a show on baboons when we published that paper, and I saw these baboons, they, what do they do all day? They eat all day. So I ran back to the lab, said to Deanna Arbel, show me a picture of what a baboon does at night. There it is. So we've evolved to eat during the day and not at night. So what happens when we um, uh, eat at the wrong time of day? So we talk about human body time and body weight regulation. It's not only what you eat, but also when you eat. So in, think, in, in terms of thinking about body weight regulation, uh, of course we know diet is important and exercise is important. What we're bringing, we're trying to bring to the forefront is that the clock is involved. And yesterday I talked about if I, I, I do not allow the animals or humans to sleep normal amounts, they also gain, they, they gain weight, show signs of the metabolic syndrome. So there's these various factors that are involved in uh, body weight uh, regulation. And then epidemiological studies have borne this out that uh, the insurance is showing sleep duration and obesity. Uh, there's huge um, uh, amounts of epidemiological data now showing that short sleep and little less data, disrupted rhythms, are involved in uh, body weight regulation. Now, I'm not going to go into the story, but it, the circadian clock system has major uh, uh, connections with um, NAD, the sirtuins, that whole system which has been linked with not only body weight regulation, but uh, longevity. And I, I just want to, I'm going to bring this up because of where I am right now. Um, calorie restriction, I think you're all familiar with, is one, it's the only only uh, behavioral manipulation that's been associated with um, longevity. And I can, I, I don't, I'm not in favor of the, the kind of calorie restriction uh, where you give individuals about only 60% of the calorie intake. Um, but it, it, it looks like eating, obviously eating less uh, is, results in um, a loss of body weight, but also isn't, related to longevity. And I think you may well be aware that there are such things as blue zones, and Okinawa is one of the blue zones. And so I'm bringing this up because of where I am today. And blue zone is where there's, there's significant evidence that the people live longer in uh, the blue zones. And I teach a class on biology of aging, and I always show this picture of, uh, of a boy being fed in Okinawa, and um, I found that one of the things that, uh, I, although I did see a McDonald's and a, and a uh, KFC, so I'm not sure you guys are, things are changing here fast, but then I found out that what this is called, 
right? Hiri Hachi Bu, which stands for eat until you're 80% full. So, um, and this whole system that's involved in what we think uh, is the Sirtuins and the NAD, uh, the clock system is involved in that. And I just want to say that uh, this is particularly relevant um, um, today, so to speak. Um, the Okinawans, um, most humans uh, forced or at least have a low-calorie diet. The people on this island, at least at the time I made this slide, uh, had about 70% of the caloric intake as the rest of Japan. Uh, I don't know what it is today. And you have 40 times the incidence of people over 100 and less diabetes and, and tumors. And today in your newspaper, it actually was yesterday, uh, not that I read the Japanese one, but there's an English newspaper, and it talked about Japan now, I didn't realize this, is the, of the 204 countries, you have more people over the percentage, you have more, a higher percentage of people over the age of 65 than any other country in the world. And Okinawa is at the very, the end of that, of that probably bell-shaped curve for all of Japan. So I just bring that up to point out that the circadian clock system has been linked to the calorie restriction uh, uh, system. Okay, I want to spend um, about 10 minutes now. Take it easy, Bogdan. I'm not going to go two and a half hours, which is what she was worried about. Um, by talking to you about this circadian dysregulation and other things, okay? So I say A, B, C, D, and F. Because I've been involved in these workshops, it's what's great about this field of circadian rhythms, I can talk about anything. I don't know anything what I'm talking about except the circadian rhythm part. But I get invited to things like, in 2008, the National Institute of Mental Health, they took eight or nine circadian people, put us in a room with eight or nine people involved in uh, studying depression, other, maybe other psychiatric disorders, and what's the role of circadian dysregulation in mental health? So let's watch this now. That was 2008. 2009, Heart Lung Blood Institute called a workshop to do the same thing. 2010, what, NIDDK said, hey, we ought to get into this circadian dysregulation and uh, diabetes and digestive and kidney diseases. Uh, National Institute on Aging in 2010 had a similar workshop, this circadian dysregulation and aging. Uh, this was a grant we had from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, Circadian Rhythms and Alcohol-Induced Tissue Damage. See the variety of systems I'm trying, I'm trying to get that across. It's not just metabolic. And then this is my, one of my favorite ones. I was invited to the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, 2013. That's not that long ago. And I'm, I'm talking about the circadian clock genes, and I know, I know nothing about musculoskeletal. So that's my point. I don't know anything about arthritis, musculoskeletal, but I'm talking with these people, and there's somebody in the front row, I, I won't say where he was from, but he's chairman of a major department on the west coast of the United States of a private institution. Oh, I probably said too much. And, and he's, he's, on, he's on his computer, and I'm thinking, oh, this guy's probably playing some computer game or something, and he goes, Fred, did you know there are clock genes in the skin cells? Now this is the chairman of the department, of a major dermatology, of a dermatology department in a major institution in 2013 was unaware of circadian clock genes in skin cells. I'm not blaming him. I'm just saying it wasn't part of the field. And it, all of some of these fields are moving faster than others. Circadian dysregulation and metabolic disorders moving fast. Over my right shoulder, circadian dysregulation and immune function. Left shoulder, circadian dysregulation, and cancer. So the field is moving very rapidly into these uh, domains. And let me just show you, this is a study we did a long time ago, but even before the, the, we really had a handle on, on, on clock genes and, and their role in health and disease. Very simple experiment. Um, essentially have animals, uh, hamsters on a light dark cycle. And then these were animals, I always say, Chicago, Tokyo, Tokyo, Chicago, Every week, shifted them back and forth. I'm just going to give you this feeling of, of the, the, the breath. And then we looked at mortality. And this happened to be, we were working with a, a hamster that uh, develops early heart disease. Uh, and you can see that the animals that were the control animals, this is their longevity curve. And the animals that were manipulated on a weekly basis uh, obviously had changes in longevity. Then I got, I got 
interested, not that I got interested, some people in the, in the gastrointestinal world came to me, and I didn't even know what gut leaking this was a few years ago. And they said, we think that gastrointestinal diseases may be related to circadian disorganization. So I said, what, what, what's one of your models? And they have, um, you, you could increase gut permeability, otherwise known as gut leakiness, uh, with alcohol. And so we put environmentally, we shipped at the animals every week, like dark cycle, boom, 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 boom. And you can see they have much more, this is a measure of gut leakiness, shipped to the animals. The clock mutant animal, circadian disruption, gut leakiness more than the littermate controls. So now the gastrointestinal world, and I'm going to come back to that at the very end. Um, then something like pregnancy. Um, we did this paper just a few years old. We, we took mice on, left them on a light dark cycle. Uh, mice uh, take about 20 days from uh, fertilization to birth. So every five days, we phase the lead, the, the light, dark cycle. This is supposed to be dark, light. So you can see it's delaying it. And then we had another group. We advanced the clock. And I was actually looking. It was funded by the March of Dimes. I was looking for premature birth. I thought, this is cool. This is going to be, because premature birth is a, not that it's cool to have premature birth, but it would be cool to link circadian disruption and premature birth. Um, and what we found was not premature birth. We found no birth. Well, no birth is an exaggeration. This is percent of mice who actually uh, produce litters. And the phase shifted. We get about, this is 67 black. We usually get about 90% success. Uh, we know that they, were, uh, it, they, that they were fertilized, impregnated, because we know they, had, they had vaginal plugs. If we delayed the animals, uh, nine out of 18 gave birth, and the phase advances, I'm not going to try to go into why advances tend to be more disruptive, but you can see this huge uh, decrease in births. We're still very fascinated with this question of what role may um, uh, um, the circadian disruption play in fertility. So you, um, after, uh, after intercourse, it takes, after, after, uh, Fertilization, it takes five days before the egg implants, and I only found this out recently, in mice and in humans, before it implants in the uterine wall. So you can imagine if early in pregnancy you're having a disruption of the circadian clock system, and you may lose, you may lose the baby very early, and you won't even know that you, you know, you've lost the baby in the first 30 days. You may have a delayed uh, uh, in your menstrual cycle. So this is still a... a just an area that I'm just trying to use that as an example. But because we were studying disruption of the, of the digestive system, um, we said, ah, I don't like microbiota. It's too complicated. But we decided to look at the microbiota of the animals, the clock mutant animals and the phase shifted animals. And I just summarized so I can finish on time. And we published a paper in 2014 showing that there was dysbiosis, or really there was, that means changes in the microbiota, which we think are negative. There was an increase, uh, signif very significant increase in the relative abundance of pro-inflammatory bacteria. So this got us into the microbiota uh, world. And because I had done things with NASA for many years, um, they, I, I, I found out about the twins going, well, the twin study, um, and that was the paper that was just published in Science, where Scott Kelly went up for one year, and his, his, his twin, who was a former astronaut, was on the ground uh, during that time. And we had an omics teams. Somebody was doing proteonomics, some was genomics. A uh, number of people, two or three groups were looking at gene expression and, and looking at different uh, gene expression profiles. Um, we were doing the microbiota. And to just give you a feeling for the, the experiment. Um, and remember, the way I got involved is because disrupted sleep, disrupted rhythms, leads to changes in the microbiota in space. They have disrupted sleep. Uh, they also have disrupted circadian rhythms. So I was using that as my link to the microbiota community. So this is, represents Scott Kelly. Pre-flight, we collected fecal samples, uh, two fecal samples. Um, about, this is about 75 days or 150 days before flight. And then during flight, we collected samples um, one, two, three, four times. 
And then these are very complex experiments to do. Anything you're doing with the astronauts takes uh, a, lot of, a lot of coordination. And then we had post-flight samples and uh, Mark Kelly on the ground. And, and we found, uh, that was the paper that, we, that just um, came out a few months ago, um, that there were changes in the microbiota. Good, 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 bad, we don't really know. And plus, Scott was a sample of one, and his brother on the ground was not that good of a control because we didn't control feeding. S Scott is eating space food. Mark is eating real food. And sometimes he's in Paris, sometimes. We didn't get the fecal material when he was traveling. But we had to collect the fecal material um, when he was at home in Arizona. But we uh, were able to show that there were major changes uh, in various aspects of physiology, and in our case, the microbiota. But it was, again, it was an N of one. It had a big splash, twin study, year in space, movies being made. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I, I tried to, you know, audition for it, but I didn't get any far with that. But uh, it, it got a lot of publicity. But it, it really, I'm going to end by saying that we're doing something now that I think is much more exciting. So let me just sort of summarize before I tell you the, the end of the, of the space story. Let me just summarize what I've tried to tell you uh, so far, independent of the space. Circadian disruption in human health. In the old days, we used to think in terms of jet lag, jet lag, jet lag shift work jet lag, regulation of the sleep-wake cycle. But now that we know that all the tissues of the body have the clock, it's a new frontier of medicine. If we disrupt rhythms, how do we impact human, mental, and physical health? What levels are we doing it? And now we, we, you know, we're associating, at least in animal models, and, 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 and human, not so much models, but in terms of shift workers, and uh, we're finding that uh, people with disrupted rhythms uh, more obese, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression, Alzheimer's, et cetera. I change this depending upon where I'm talking. If I'm talking to gastroenterologists, I'll put gastrointestinal diseases there. And what I find, I like this because I came up with this idea, that this reminds me of this drawing of da Vinci's helicopter. He drew the helicopter in 1493. It took 500 years to build a helicopter. We have the blueprint of the circadian system now, the molecular genetic circadian clock. We have the blueprint of how it's interacting, not the complete blueprint, not sort of like, like this, but we've got it. So circadian clock genes and health, the blueprint is there. How do we then transfer this into a clinical practice? That's where the field is, uh, is now. So I called it a tipping point, and thank you the way you introduced me. Of, uh, of, 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 of talking about sort of future, looking at things, big picture, future ideas. Well, I think we're at a tip of point. I call it, sometimes I call it circadian medicine, sometimes I call it circadian health. What is the role, and I, I've used this, uh, uh, that uh, I think it's in my uh, uh, abstract for this meeting. You know, we're bringing time to medicine in the way that Einstein brought time to physics at the beginning of the 20th century. I think we're bringing time to medicine at the beginning of this. And it really is the beginning. So if you, one looks in the United States, there's about 6,000 sleep clinics. There are zero circadian clinics where you would go in and have a circadian profile. Ah, there's one. There's now um, one circadian clinic. Phyllis, he was a postdoc in my lab, but become really probably the most prominent uh, sleep circadian human researcher, clinician in the world. And uh, she's got a couple of lieutenants that are working with her, but she's established a circadian clinic where she has patients come in and she sees if they've got circadian disruption, she'll do some profiles on them to look at circadian organization. So I consider circadian medicine is really the next frontier uh, and the journey continues. And I'll end it with uh, saying how the journey really is continuing. I like that phrase. Um, the, um, the journey continues, I think it's in the Star Trek movies, they often talk about this, the journey continues. I've already told you about Mark and Scott, but what I'm really excited about is a project that, this is, I have to update this slide, it was not newly selected, uh, it's been done. It's the effects of spaceflight on the uh, gastrointestinal microbiota in mice. And now, and it turns out that Mark Kelly, see Mark Kelly, he actually has written a couple books for children, Mouse Journal, 
goes to Mars is one of them. And so we really, because of the Scott Kelly thing, we were selected to uh, do a study of 20 mice in space. I'm not going to go into the detail. We launched in June on SpaceX 15. It was very, very exciting. The samples were returned. Um, the fecal material and all the organs of the body of, of these mice were returned at the beginning of this year. This is just to show you a picture of the launch because I, we, we, you know, we, we love these pictures. Um, this is the launch. It was a morning launch. It was just fabulous to be part of this. And, and now we have the largest rodent study that's ever been done in space. And we can read it. And we got control mice on the ground eating the same food. I won't go into the details. I'll just say we, we got well controlled experiments. But I want to end by telling you we've just been selected for a new study which involves Japan. It, the future study, um, the title of our proposal was Impact of the Mars and Solar Data Gravity on Microbiota and Mice, Mechanisms of Multi-System Physiology. And the Japanese have a module on the space station. And in that module, they have a centrifuge for mice. The whole idea of having a centrifuge is you can have mice that are in, not centrifuge isn't moving, so they're in zero G. You can have one G, or you can have any G you want. But, uh, so our proposal is to have the mice on lunar G and Martian G, get a dose response curve, and look at the effects on the microbiota and, and other physiological systems. So um, this is not, we've been selected for funding, the negotiations are ongoing now um, between the between, I think, President Trump and Prime Minister Abe, as far as I can tell, it's at a very high level of exactly when are we going to fly, how many days are we going to get. Those are details. But I'm very excited that we'll be working with this uh, centrifuge. So of course, I have many collaborators in, in this work. I particularly want to focus on Martha Vita Turner. Um, you remember that she was the the graduate student who found the clock mutant animal, she's still working with me and she's one of the authors on that science paper. So we've been, we've been working together for a long time. Uh, and uh, Joe Takahashi, who really was the, the guy who led the cloning of the gene, uh, I went more into looking at effects of the clock gene disruption on physi physiology and behavior. Uh, Joe went more into the molecular biology uh, of it and so, but it's a great collaboration. So it's been, uh, it's been an exciting time to be part of something that was just very fundamental biology 40 years ago, and now it's sort of mainstream biology and mainstream uh, biomedicine. So thank you very much. Been